comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do
freedom Every chain is broken through you, Jesus Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom Of the Lord, there is freedom. Oh. 
Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And every chain is broken through you, Jesus. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You open your Bibles with me to Colossians. We are in chapter 1 still. We uh, began this uh, new uh, book last Sunday. Colossians chapter 1, uh, picking up in verse uh, 24, just a few verses uh, this morning. Uh, we have uh, communion after service or at the end of service. Um, while you're getting there, let me give you a recap of uh, last week's message. Um, well, first, this letter to the, the church in Colossae was written, this four-chapter letter was written, um, to address false teachings that were creeping into the church. There, there were several of them. Uh, I won't mention them again today, but we are going to uh, look at those and the specifics of those false teachings in, uh, in chapter 2 next week. Um, but there was false teachings happening in, um, within the church Different teachers would come in. They would bring different philosophies and legalism and whatnot. And um, part of those, or one prominent false teaching, was that Christ was not God or he was less than God. And that's why in chapter 1, Paul starts off with that, the, uh, the preeminence of Christ, who he is, what the firstborn over all creation, firstborn over the dead uh, means. And what Paul was trying to do is, is exalt Christ to the highest point he could to address the fact that there is no one higher. Anything else, you know, is just, you know, rubbish. Any, any, any teaching that tries to reduce the, the person or the work of Christ is, is rubbish. It attacks the gospel. It attacks the, who Christ is and what he came to do. So uh, Paul addresses that uh, in chapter 1, beautiful chapter. Um, today we are looking at three things that Paul wants to uh, address as well from verses 24 to 29 here. And I have the outline for you. Let's look, at, let's look at the outline before we pray here. Paul's suffering, verse 24. Paul's stewardship, and then Paul's striving. Suffering, stewardship, and striving is what we're going to talk about uh, this uh, morning. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we, we do thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for saving us. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you're going to do in us this morning. Our prayer is always that you would grow us in your word, that you would uh, draw others to yourself, that you would uh, add to your church, Lord, those who are, are being saved. Uh, we ask, Lord, uh, for the, the women, the ladies that are not here today, the, uh, the ladies at the Bible College in Murrieta at their retreat. We just ask that you would encourage them and fill them with uh, more of you, Lord, and that you would bring them back safely to their families. Uh, so we pray for travel mercies, Lord, and, uh, and, uh, and we ask that you take care of our children next door, our, our teenagers and our, and our, and our babies and, and uh, elementary age kids. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing we're going to touch on is the sufferings of Christ. Not Christ, but the sufferings of Paul, excuse me. The sufferings of Paul. And this one verse that we're looking at first, verse 24, in my studies, I had to spend more time on it just to further clarify because it's easy to get the wrong impression of what this verse is actually saying. Some have wrongly taught that this verse is teaching that somehow Paul is expiating or, you know, paying for sins by his sufferings. Okay? So it's important that we spend uh, ample time on this one verse correcting what it doesn't say and addressing what, what it does say. It says in verse 24, we're in chapter 1 here of Colossians. Paul says, I now re rejoice in my sufferings for you. Who's the you? The Colossians, the, uh, the church in Colossae, mainly Gentiles, right? The, church, the Gentile church. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh. The word can also be rendered complete in my flesh. What is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. You and I, we are the corporate body of Christ on earth. Christ is the head. He said that already earlier in chapter 1. He is the head over the body. We are, we are we're the church. We're the body. He functions through us. Christ is in heaven sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is the head. We are the church. 
his body. In Acts chapter 9, we, we get a, really a clue into this for the first time when uh, Paul or Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church. Jesus comes to him, and this is, this is again, post-crucifixion Jesus, the glorified Jesus, right? The exalted Jesus. He's shining bright, and he, he addresses Paul, and the first thing he says to Paul or Saul is, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, And it's not because Christ had not already been persecuted because he had been persecuted on the cross, okay, that was finished. But in one sense, Christ was still suffering through the church in a very real sense. When someone is martyred, Paul being beheaded for his faith, all, all the, the disciples who died and suffered and every, every, you know, people still, did you know that Christianity is the most persecuted uh, religion in the world today? Now we see it more in, in the you know in the east. We see it more over there, especially in a lot of communist uh, countries and Islamic prominent uh, nations. We see a lot of that happening, and there it can rightly be said that Christ is still suffering in that sense, and that is a sense that Paul is trying to communicate here. Not that Paul is somehow not that Jesus came short in his sufferings on the cross, and that Paul now has to sort of you know complete. Or, you know, fill in the gap that Jesus, you know, failed to meet. That is not what this passage is teaching. It's important that we understand the sufficiency of Christ in salvation. That it's, it's been paid for. It's, been, it's one sacrifice for all, for eternity, forever. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that. But this man, <clears throat> after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting Till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one sacrifice he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. One sacrifice perfected forever. Notice that. So, I mean, it, it's a good example since we're, we're, we are having communion after service. <clears throat> when we have communion, we are not teaching that Christ is being re-crucified or represented to us in any way, shape, or form. We see it as some, we believe that that's something symbolic. We stick to the text. It says, you know, do this in remembrance of me. When you do this, you are proclaiming my death, right? So that's, we limit it to that. That's what, it, that's what the text says. But some believe, like the Roman Catholic Church, that you are sort of representing Christ, re-sacrificing Christ, even though he's not there, even, even though it's not literally his blood or literally his, you know, his body. To a degree, they say they are, they are sort of representing Christ. And to that they add that as a work, a meritorious work that is, you know, expiating or expiating certain sins that you committed maybe the pre previous week. But that's not what we believe the Bible teaches. We see it as a memorial service. And one evidence of that is that when they were, when Christ initiated communion, they were in the midst of doing another meal that was symbolic as well. Okay, the Last Supper there. The Paschal Lamb, they were looking back to what God had did in their lives. Remember in Egypt when they were delivered, the last plague, the death of the firstborn, killing the lamb, putting the blood on the doorposts so they can be saved, spared from the judgment that was to come. They were doing that symbolically as well, eat, eating the bitter herbs. The Passover meal though, eating the bitter herbs. Yeah, um, the lamb that was there as well, roasted. All the, I mean, they were in drink, drink, eating that and saying, oh, my sins are being forgiven. It, they knew, they understood, this, in Jewish thought, that was symbolic. They were looking back so they won't, wouldn't forget what God has done for them. So when Christ initiates the communion, the elements, when he says, drink, this is my, my, my blood, my body, which is given for you. It's the same thing. It's something symbolic, pointing to something great. And at the moment, it had not happened yet either. They were looking forward to what he was going to do just in just hours. We look backward to what he has done, but it's still a memorial service. It's still, it's still something symbolic. We have been forgiven, as, as Hebrews says, one sacrifice for sins forever. So it's important that we understand that when Paul suffers here, it is not mediatorial suffering, okay? He's not suffering to pay for sins. He, it's ministerial suffering. That's our first point, if you're taking notes. Our suffering is ministerial, not mediatorial. When you suffer, you suffer because of the gospel. I mean, it's not foreign to, to everything Paul has said. 
He's always been suffering since the get-go. Did you know that? As soon as Paul came to Christ, they wanted to kill him because he opened his mouth and told others about Jesus. In Acts chapter 9 again, not once but twice they want to kill him, and it's not the same group of people. First, he preaches Christ in Damascus, and then they want to kill him. That's why he has to be, you know, sort of go on the run and escape in a basket there. Um, the Jews wanted to kill him there in Damascus, but when he goes to Jerusalem, still in Acts chapter 9, he goes to preach the gospel again to the Hellenists, and now these, you know, these guys want to kill him as well. Why is that? Because Paul was sharing Jesus. And that's what happens when you share Jesus. That's what happens when you stand up for Jesus. When you stand up for the truth, you are going to be persecuted. Jesus said, you know, if I was persecuted, you're going to be persecuted. So, I mean, a good thing to address here, since we're talking about sufferings um, for, for the word of God, for the gospel, is, you know, if everybody likes you, if everybody likes me, then probably I'm not displaying the the Christ that offended people with the gospel. Because if Jesus would have never offended anybody, he would have never been crucified, right? He was crucified because he offended especially the religious leaders. And if we don't offend anybody with the gospel, not with our attitude, because our attitude can offend, my attitude can offend as well, but with the gospel, just, sim just simply what the Bible says, that's going to offend if it's doing its work. The reason we came to Christ is because we were offended to the degree that we understood we were not good enough, right? And then we said, yes, Lord, amen, you're right. And, and we repented and we trusted in Jesus, right? So the gospel is going to offend. A good question is, what Christ am I represent? What Jesus do people see in me? Do people see in me the unloving Turner Burn Jesus? Or do they see the tie-dye wearing pacifist Jesus? Okay, that doesn't offend anybody. Let me tell you that neither of those Jesus are the biblical Jesus. Jesus is perfect. He, he is love. Jesus is God. God is love. But God is also a consuming fire. So Jesus is perfect. You know, he, he exhibits perfect justice, righteousness, and love as well at the same time. It's something we need, to, we need to understand. Our suffering is ministerial, not mediatorial. There is going to be suffering when we stand up for the things that the Bible teaches. And often, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily going to be the gospel, but just subjects in the Bible. I stand for marriage between one man and one woman. In today's culture, especially now, well, you're going to be seen as bigoted because you stand for biblical marriage. It's always been that way. Okay, the, 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 the Bible does not conform to the culture. The culture needs to conform to the Bible, right? We, we don't change. The Bible never changes. It stays the same. And so then, because as the world gets darker and darker, as the world continues to suppress the truth and turn things again backwards, or as, as they've always been since Adam fell, you're going to see more persecution. If, that, that, if you stand up for Jesus like Paul was, you're going to suffer. And the idea here, when, when Paul says that he has to fill something up, I want you to get the, the picture here of a cup of suffering. And I think every one of us has a cup of suffering that we have to fill up in suffering. There's going to be things that, I mean, I don't want to know, but I know if the Lord tarries and I live more years, um, there's going to be things I'm going to have to deal with, certain sufferings. Some of you have already, but you're still filling up that cup if you're still breathing. So every one of us has a set of sufferings that we have to go through. And, and, and Paul says, I rejoice, right? Not many of us can say that when we're going through persecution, when, you know, when we maybe, maybe some of you have lost your jobs because, you know, you wanted to stay true to the word of God or, I know for sure rejection by family members because, you know, you're a Christian and you stand for truth. You're not, you're not getting drunk anymore. You're not, you know, saying the things you used to say. You know, that, that stuff happens very often, but that's an evidence that you're following Jesus, that we're following the Lord. So the Bible also says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And that is true. Paul, you know, the Lord told Paul, or the Lord said right from the get-go there that Paul had many sufferings to go through. This is found in Acts chapter 9, verse 15 to 16. Jesus said to Ananias, He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. No, Paul is not bearing sins. He is bearing Christ before people. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. For Christ we will suffer. And that's the difference. Jesus suffered on the cross, but we suffer as we carry our cross. Does that make sense? And that's what the Lord meant by deny yourself, Albert, carry your cross, and follow me. We cannot 
follow him if we don't carry our cross. There, there's got to be sufferings and rejections. And it's not a popular subject, but it's, it's, it's a subject we cannot skip over. We must address in, in our lives. So second point, we have a cup to fill and a cross to carry. Sufferings to fill, struggles to carry because of the gospel. Here's an interesting quote from John Piper. This is what he had to say about verse 24 here. What's missing is the in-person presentation of Christ's sufferings to the people for whom he died. The afflictions are lacking in the sense that they are not seen and known among the nations. They must be carried by the ministers of the gospel. Paul sees his own suffering as the visible reenactment of the sufferings of Christ so that they will see Christ's love for them. In other words, as Paul preaches the gospel and he's stoned and he's whipped and he's persecuted, as others see this happening, they're going to see the authenticity of God's love. They might have not, the Gentiles might have not been there, witnessed Christ, you know, crucified, but they can see his minister. They can see us as we stand firm in the midst of persecution. That is an evidence. You know, that is also a way to preach the gospel. You're, you're part of your, our testimony when we stand true, when we don't retaliate, you know, when we don't answer back the same way they, they treat us, right? And I'm, I mean, I understand. We have rights. We can defend ourselves. We can do certain things. But never, get, never allow it to get to the point where you are, you know, cursing and, you know, at the same level. You're, you're not depicting Christ. You're depicting the flesh when we do that. That does not show the gospel. That might show Peter with the sword, right? But not... Not the gospel. We have a cup to fill and a cross to carry. So I believe, before we move on to the next verse, that when Paul says about these sufferings that were lacking in Christ, or afflictions in Christ, I think he's talking about the fellowship of the sufferings that bring him closer to the Lord as he suffers. And I think that's what he hinted at in Philippians 3.10, if you can look there with me. Paul says that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That doesn't sound like Paul was living a purpose-driven life, or his best life now. I think he was living a purpose-driven death, right? And that is the gospel, you know. It will bring death, but it brings, gives glory to God. It's important to understand that, I think. Another thing to know is that the gospel does not lack in power, but it can lack in practice. The gospel does not lack in power, but it, it can lack in practice. And what I mean by that is that, you know, Christ is sufficient. The gospel is sufficient. It's like if you win the lottery, but nobody ever tells you, or a rich dead uncle dies, but the lawyer never goes and tells you that you've inherited so much, it's, it's useless, right? Christ has died. He has risen. But if you never hear that message, it's sort of useless, right? You, that's why Romans 10, that's why Paul says in Romans 10, you know, how is somebody going to know unless somebody tells them? And, and guess what? That's you and I. We've we got to tell people so they can benefit from this. And that's what I mean by practice. The gospel does not lack in power, but it lacks in practice sometimes. In my life, first and foremost, it lacks in practice. What are some examples? Well, when I refuse to share it and I make life about me today, it's not going to be seen in practice. If I compromise my beliefs for the sake of friendships or even money, that's a common thing as well. Well, I want to get the raise, and, you know, I want to do this job. It's bringing food. It's, it, you know, I'm putting food on the table or whatever. Um, but it's got, it's got glorified through that. You know, it's got glorified through what you're doing. I think these things can take away from the practice of the preaching of the gospel. So here's the question before we move on. What version of Jesus do people see in me? What version of Jesus do people see in me? Are they seeing the suffering Savior are they seeing someone who, who lays out the truth in a loving manner, who does not hold back from, 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 from warning men? Now, number two, Paul's stewardship, verses 25 to 28. Let me start by defining the word stewardship before we, we begin reading here. Stewardship is the supervising of a responsibility given to you. How many of you have children? Raise your hand. You are stewards over your children. How many of you have money? Raise your hand. Okay, I hope so. <laughs> Anything, right? 
So you are stewards over how little or how much you have. You're still stewards of whatever you have, right? If you're married, you're a steward over your spouse and so on. That's what stewardship means. I think we, we sort of understand that. Well, if you have Christ, you are a steward of Christ in you. If you have gifts, you're a steward of those gifts. And the gospel, we, 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 the faith that we have, we're stewards of the faith. I mean, Jude alludes to that, right? Contending for the faith that has been entrusted to the saints. We must contend for this faith. We've been entrusted with it. So that's stewardship. What stewardship did Paul, let's let Paul say, tell us what stewardship is. He says in verse 25, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul wasn't just, you know, filling a cup of suffering, but fulfilling the word of God for himself. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. What min mystery is this? This was unique to a degree to Paul because Paul was a minister to the Gentiles to give him the gospel. But one of the reasons that Paul was persecuted so, um, so much was because Paul, being a Jew, ministered the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Jews, a lot of the Jews, the more religious Jews, hated the Gentiles. Some taught, well, you know, if, if they brushed up against him on the marketplace accidentally, they, they would have to take their clothes off and burn it, right? Or some even had prayers like, well, you know, Lord, I thank you that, you know, that I wasn't born a Gentile. Um, some, some, some even believe, some rabbis even taught that, you know, Gentiles were, you know, God created Gentiles to, to kindle the fires of hell. So there was this animosity between Jews and Gentiles. And now you have the new covenant. You have Paul here, minister of Christ, chosen by the risen Christ, and he's preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He's saying, no, no, you don't, you don't have to get circumcised to, come to, to, to be a part of the blessings, to be a son of Abraham. You, all you have to do is trust by faith in Jesus Christ, and you're good. So you can see that that really upset a lot of these, you know, even professing, believing Jews. That's why we have the, the Judaizers. So that's what the Bible refers to, mystery here, that, that has been hidden. The Old Testament prophets talked about it, alluded to it in the messianic prophecies of Jesus, but they didn't have the full picture till Christ came, and now Paul reveals that. Verse 27, he says, To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Notice, among the Gentiles, and I love this, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So because Paul preached that message that Christ can be in you apart from the law, apart from you, despite you, that upset many people and that brought persecution to Paul. But that's really what the gospel is. It really comes down to Christ in you, to what the, the glory of the Lord. Paul said this in Galatians 3.28. I don't have it up here, but you can go there if you'd like. But he says this, that Galatians 3.28 there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the, the, the mystery, being one in the church. It's not replacement theology. We're not saying that the church has replaced is Israel at all. God is still going to fulfill his promises to Israel. But we're saying that they are one in the same when, one, when the Jew believes in Christ. And sometimes we call them Messianic Jews to be technical, but the reality is that they are Christians, we are Christians. We are one. It's a different entity, the church. What else? Let's continue here. Verse 28. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Every man being everybody, not just men, but women as well. Preaching the gospel to, to whoever would hear. So what does Paul mean by preaching, warning, and teaching what does he mean by that? I think he's talking about discipleship. I think he's talking about making somebody whole by giving them the whole counsel of God. Paul did that. He gave those that would listen anyways the whole counsel of God. Whatever God's will is for, for our lives, he, he gave it to them. He laid it out to them. He tells the Ephesian elders when they had, I think it was like the first pastor's conference in, in the book of Acts. He tells the Ephesian elders that, you know, I haven't held back the, um, the full counsel of God to you. I, I have given it to you guys. I have not shrunk back from doing that. 
So one thing that verse 28 tells me, because it says that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, it tells me one thing about Paul's attitude and character. Paul was not content with shallow professions. Paul was not content with maybe, you know, sinner's prayer. Off you go. No, he was about discipleship. He was about, you know, investing in people. He, he really was about, you know, the output, what, what, what happened with the lives that he invested in. He wanted rapport. He wanted to see what happened. And a lot of the guys that Paul discipled, they went on to plant churches. They went on to, to be pastors and leaders and so on. And you know what? That should not be foreign to our lives either because we also are called to make, to make disciples. Here's the verse I was mentioning earlier, Acts 20, verse 7. Paul says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. We, if we're going to be whole Christians, we need the whole Bible, right? We cannot just be John 3, 16 Christians. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the gospel, but we need the meat too. We need to grow in that. That is the foundation, but we've got to build on that foundation, which is Christ Jesus with the rest of the scriptures. It's important that we are well-rounded believers, and that's why I said last week, we never graduate from Bible study, right? We've got to continue growing in knowledge and faith and all these things. See, Paul was looking, Paul, don't, don't misunderstand me, but Paul was looking for fat people, okay? You and I need to be fat people. Faithful, available, and teachable is what I mean by fat. When we are, when we are fat, we are fit. That's our next point. When we are faithful, to God when we are available before the body of Christ and when we are teachable. God can use us. We can be discipled, you know? We can be discipled. We, we can grow and, and we can go. That, that was another point from maybe years back, but when we grow, we go. That's, you know, healthy sheep beget more sheep. And you and I are sheep. We, we got to grow. We're students of the Word of God. Or at least we should be. But fat people are fit people. Let me break that down. People who are faithful are true to God, and they don't really play church. They're not the ones that, you know, that play church. Um, people who are available, they make themselves accessible. Am I accessible to, to the body of Christ? To, to, you know, again, we are, we are called the body of Christ because we are hands, we, we are feet. Some are in the background. Some, some are doing things that are not necessarily in the forefront, but they are still just as important as the, the eyes of the church, the mouth of the church, you know, just as important. Even though, the, I forget who, what pastor, I think it was John Corson, but he said, you know, even you, know, you have the toes in the church, right? You can't see them, but you know, with, without them, the toes and the feet, the church wouldn't go anywhere, you know? And, and that's the thing. We, we're all part of this body of Christ, but we all have to be fat people if we're going to be fit people. Fat people are fit people. Teachable as well. You know, that this really implies humility. I'm never going to know it all. I don't know it all. I, I, and we need to understand that because if we ever get to the point where, you know, I know enough, then that's the point where you're not going to know anymore because you think you know enough or you think you know it all. So if you remain humble, if I remain humble, then I'm always in, there's always going to be room for growth. I'm, I'm going to be um, teachable. Let's be teachable because if you can be teachable, then you're reachable and you can reach others for, for the gospel. Fat people are fit people. New Testament discipleship was not, you know, I enrolled for a class, I got a certificate, and I'm a disciple now. No, the New Testament discipleship was similar to the Judaic discipleship where, like, the rabbi or the teacher, like, that was the guy, like, you, you know, you ate with him, you, you, you did life with him. Jesus, Jesus taught that way as well. He, he didn't say, well, guys, see you next Sunday, I'm going to feed the 5,000, hope you can make it. Uh, no, it wasn't like that. It was like, you, we're, we're together, we're, do, we're fellowshipping together. And you know what? I think Jesus had a sense of humor. I think Jesus joked around with the, his disciples, you know. Um, that's, that's discipleship. It's life. It's fellowship. We need that to grow. It's not just, you know, 45 minutes on Sunday or an hour on Sunday. That's essential. That's important. That needs to happen. But we need everything. It needs to be life. So a good question is, are we doing that? Another question is, Am I making disciples? Never think that, well, that was for Paul. Or that's just for the apostles, the sent out ones. Yes, Paul was an apostle. Paul had a specific calling to the Gentiles. 
but we're all called to make disciples. And Jesus made that clear. Matthew, what is it, 28? He made that clear. We'll look at that verse in a little bit. But it's clear that Paul, even though he had his specific calling to Gentiles and Peter to the Jews, you know, everybody did what they were called to do. If you're called to, you know, maybe do a ministry like Ray Comfort and maybe stand, you know, somewhere, you know, if you're short, stand in a little box and get a, a speakerphone and just preach to the people, to, to strangers and all that, then do it by all means. Um, but I think generally, for the most part, you're, we're all ministers of the gospel in the context, in the setting of where we're already at. So if you're retired and you're living, you know, at the little trailer park here, Hey, if you're spending ample time with your, you know, unbelieving neighbors, preach the gospel there when you're playing bingo, you know, or, you know, whatever you're doing. Or, you know, if you're working, your coworkers, that is the setting that God has put you in. It's, it's very natural. It's very gradual when, it, when we do it that way. And it should be happening, I think, which we should still be making disciples. I'll tell you what, it's not going to happen if not, I'm not being faithful. It's not going to happen if I'm compromising my beliefs right now. I mean, I, I, if I'm comfortable, then I'm not going to really want to do much. But if, and I think that's why the Lord uses persecution sometimes to get us out of our comfort zone, to, to start praying again, to start seeking him and his will, and then he can start using us. Because see, we're, we're held accountable to what God has given us. What are you doing with the gospel that God has given you? Are you preaching it? Are you, are you sharing it with other folks? Better to be fat people so we can be fit people. So here's Matthew 28. This is the Great Commission. You can go there if you'd like. I actually don't have it up here. It's a little bit longer. But Matthew 28 is, is a passage that we should all be familiar with. Matthew 28 are Jesus' last words to his disciples before he leaves. Now in Acts chapter 1, it talks a few other last words as well. But, but these are his definitely ending words to them. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, notice this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And this is why I read verse 18 because it's, it's, it's a part of the thought in verse 19. He says, go therefore, or because of what I just told you, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So be it, is what amen means. So, if anything, this means that God is for you when it comes to preaching the gospel. This is a promise from Jesus to you and I. But sometimes we don't want this blessing because it comes with stressing, right? It comes with rejection. It comes with, you know, separation. But did you know that Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. I came to bring a sword, the conflict between a father and a son, mother and daughter, because of the gospel. That's what the gospel does. It brings separation when we truly hold it up. And by the way, I'm not saying that every unbeliever is going to be, you know, the militant atheist or the militant agnostic. I know there are a lot of people that, hey, they're good for you. I'm glad that works for you. You know, they're, um, what's the word? You know, they're, Neither nor. They're, okay, good for you. And the reality is that we still have to preach the gospel. Sometimes it's, it's, it's harder to, to preach the gospel to people like that. They sort of make it seem like, oh, yeah, I believe in God. But you know they, they don't really believe in God because it's not showing in their lives. Yet Jesus says, I'm going to be with you if you do this. I'm sending you out with authority. You have your fishing license, if you will, to go and preach the gospel, make disciples, teaching people, right? Did you know when Jesus says that, I'm going to be with you, there's some bigger significance to that. It's not like God is uh, omnipresent. We know God is here now. We know God is here when we leave too. At 3 a.m. and when it's dark here, no living soul is here. God is still here. He's omnipresent. But that's not what Jesus means when he says, you know, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. One way to, to sort of understand this is by looking at Matthew 18. And we use this verse a lot when we're talking about the prayer meeting and prayer. And you, I think you can use it for that, but the reality is that that verse is talking about church discipline and conflict resolution between two people, sometimes three when you have a mediator there. In Matthew 18, you know, where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them, right? Jesus is there when there's one. 
When your prayer closet, he's there. He's there when there's thousands. But the idea is when two people come together to solve a conflict, Christ is there in the sense that I'm for you. I'm going to bless this meeting, right? Even with church discipline, when, you know, there isn't resolution and there's excommunication, well, God is going to bless that as well. The Lord, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, the Lord is going to let Satan out on his leash, and the person that wants to live in sin, they're going to see the consequences of that. But that's another, another story. The point being is that if you go preach the gospel, God is going to bless it. Even if there's going to be rejection, that's a promise that we can take to, to the bank. Number two, last verse, verse 29. Paul's striving. Here we see the degree of Paul's fervency. Here we see where Paul gets his power to do what he did in his life. It says in verse 29, To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Let's address the first part of this verse. And there's two words here that I want you to take note of, and that's labor and striving. The word labor, if you got maybe um, a more modern translation, a more paraphrased translation, it might say something along the lines of being weary to the point of exhaustion or something like that. And that's what Paul means by labor here. The, the word actually means that. It means it's not easy work. It, it's not, you know, 30 minutes for Jesus. It's, it's, it's really investing and laboring, putting sweat into the ministry. Jesus, uh, Paul did not wing it in the ministry. I can't wing it either. I can't. I can't say, well, you know, if I study, then I'm not being very spiritual. No, we, we need to study, right? We need to labor in the Word of God. But I can't say, well, I'm just not going to do anything for the rest of the week. And when I get, right before I teach, I'm going to just pray and ask God to fill me with His Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say what He wants me to say. That's not how it works. We, we see two things happening here. A man laboring and striving and God working in him mightily. And that's how it works, right? I think somebody put it like this, if I can remember the exact quote. Um... Pray like if everything depended on God and work like if everything depended on you. Knowing that, you know what, without God, you can't do anything. And that's how we should do things. We should do our best in whatever we do for the Lord. But then at the end of the day, we need to trust that he's, he's in control of all of it. So the second word I want you to take note of is a word, um, uh, striving. Striving. This word striving is also interesting as well because we get our English word for agony or agonizing as well. And this word was used in the Olympic Games with athletes, especially wrestlers and, and fighters, uh, to mean, you know, refer to the, the fights, the, the boxing matches or whatnot. And they're striving. So Paul was like an athlete. He was like a runner for Jesus. He, he trained hard. He, he worked hard. He put in the work, and he was faithful to to strive hard for Jesus. So a question for me now is, well, how much work am I putting into the, the, the gospel? Am I doing the best I can, or am I just, you know, doing a half job? And sometimes they can be seen in the ministry when we just do half efforts. If you want God to change your marriage, but you're only willing to do 50%, that's, that should be your output. You're not, you're not going to get any more from, from the, your spouse. But if you, if you don't see marriage as 50-50 like the world sees it, but if you see it as 100-100 because Jesus is not... Jesus does not go to the moon and say, if you can make it to the moon, then I'll save you. Jesus went all the way from heaven to earth to save us, right? That is 100, 100. We need to respond to service to Jesus. So my point is this. Just like Paul says here, you know, I'm, I'm laboring, I'm striving. We also should labor and strive, strive in, in the word of God, in, in the Lord. Last night I watched a, a boxing match um, between Canelo and, and I think Daniel Jacobs. And you know, my guy won, Canelo won. Of course, um, but he didn't win because he just, you know, hung out with his family the whole time during his training and just ate whatever he wanted. You know, he won really because he trained. He, he, he was disciplined. He, you know, he was patient. He maneuvered well. And the other guy, I'm sure, did as well, right? So that pays off when you're in the ring. We're all in the ring of life. It's going to pay off if you're disciplined, if you're laboring in prayer in the Word of God, depending on Jesus. It's going to pay off. I'm the type of person that always thinks, no, they're not going to want to hear. They're just going to, I'm going to look stupid. And it's okay. It's okay to look stupid for Jesus. It's okay to be rejected for Jesus. That's okay. He cares. You're not saving anybody. I'm not saving anybody. It's, 
It's the word of God that's going to do what it's going to do. And I say this to encourage you guys that, you know, maybe you've been praying for somebody to come to Jesus, a son, a daughter, a mother, father. You know what? You, you, you open your mouth and let God do what he's going to do. You keep praying for them. And God is going to bring the changes. I think slowly but surely. Nonetheless, Paul is not saying, look, I'm, I'm something, you know, I'm what's up. He's not saying, I'm, you know, I'm so disciplined or whatever. It wasn't by Paul's strength alone. It was by the Lord. Because it says, the rest of the verse says, according to his working which works in me mightily. Literally, it means in accord with his energy operating in me powerfully. I like the, liter the more literal translation better. By the way, just for you guys that are, you know, Bible students here, just some free resources. Um, if you haven't gone here before, I encourage you guys to go. Uh, it's uh, scripture, the number four, all.org. Scriptureforall.org. That's what I use sometimes to, to study. It, it, gives, it lays out the scriptures and in the interlinear form, literal, and it tells you. It doesn't flow as good as the English, but it's as literal as it can get, and it's a pretty good study tool. Scriptureforall.org. So that's what's happening here. Paul's not saying, I got it. He's saying God has it, but that doesn't excuse me from trying my best. What happens when we think, oh, it's just me, when we're like uh, Elijah. Remember Elijah? He has a great victory on, on uh, Mount Carmel, Right? He, he goes against these prophets of Baal, and, and then he comes down. He's probably coming down the mountain, you know, just, you know, I, I did something great. You know, God came through. Yeah. He comes down a mountain, and then we see a text message sent from Jezebel to him. And uh, she's like, I'm going to, you know, uh, she swears on, on Baal, the same prophet, the same false god that was just proven to be false. And even though that has no weight to it, he believed it. That's what mattered. He came back to faith. He, he took his eyes off of the Lord, and he put his eyes on the words of a woman. That's what happens when you put, take your eyes off of God's word, and you put your eyes on anybody else's word. You're going to believe that, and what happens? He gets discouraged. He gets suicidal. He runs the opposite way. When he comes before the Lord, he's like, Lord, I'm the only one left. And God's like, no, there, I got hundreds of others. Not just you, but sometimes that's what we feel. Like, man, I'm the only person doing something, and people are discouraging me, and this and that. That's not the case. Many other people are going through the same things as you and I are. So this is what I'm trying to say. Don't quit, okay? Don't, don't tap out, tap in, understanding that God is giving you enough grace to keep going, whatever that is. That's our next point. Let's look at that. We have to tap in so we don't tap out. Because see, Paul, Paul is not saying that he has to climb a mountain here to get God's grace. He's not saying I got to do this and that to, you know, to get energy or power, as it says here, literally. But he says, according to his working, which works in me mightily. So really, this is just one thing that's happening. It's God's grace working through Paul. But I want you to notice that Paul was not a rag doll and he was not demon. It, it's not like the demon possession, you know, like that we see in Hollywood. That you get demon possessed and you have no control over what's going on. No, when, when God lives in you, you, you have control, you, you have a will. That's what, or else the Bible wouldn't say, you know, don't suppress, you know, the spirit of truth. Don't question the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Because we still have the possibility of choosing not to listen to, to God's voice. Which we have the possibility of not tapping into, you know, God's power within us. Paul says, I'm going to do as much as I can, trusting that God is the one doing it within me and through me. We have to tap in so we don't tap out. It's like last week what I said. Dependency is an abundancy. Dependency is an abundancy. Or abundancy is independency, excuse me. And I think that's what Paul is trying to say here in 1 Corinthians 15.10. It says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Did you know that that same grace that was in Paul is in you today, if you're a true believer? It's in you, so you, you can tap into that grace. See, grace means God's unmerited favor, but grace comes in the form of strength, encouragement, wisdom. That's grace. This is the, the practicality of grace in our lives. So you have strength when you are weak as well. When you're discouraged, when you want to quit on, on God or, or your marriage or whatever, there's grace to be found. And when you can find grace, you won't find an excuse. 
not a legitimate one, legitimate excuse anyway. We have to tap in so we don't tap tap out. So two things, human effort, divine assistance. Never stop working hard because you think, well, God is going to come through anyway. No, that's why we pray, even though God knows what we, want, what we need. So I'll finish with this while the communion elements are being passed out. Paul had grace ready to be accessed, right? But this grace was most mostly revealed when Paul was at, a, was at his lowest point. When Paul was the weakest, he was the strongest. Now, some of you might know where, what verse I'm going to now. But when Paul was in pain, when Paul was in suffering, and even in chains, he seemed to be the strongest. In, in, in my life, personally, I think I am the weakest when I am most comfortable, when I am more fuller. Last verse here, 2 Corinthians 12. 9 to 10. Paul got a thorn in his flesh. I think it was some physical ailment. Some believe it was having to do with his eyes. Whatever that was, he prayed three times and God said no. And he tells him why. He said to me, Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you. Literally, the grace of me is sufficient for you. It's almost like if God was telling Paul, I am sufficient, Paul. I am what you need. I am all you need. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength can be made complete. That's the word perfect means. You can have God's complete, completeness and strength in you when you are weak, when you're down in the dumps, when you've got a misbehaving child that never listens, right? When the cancer comes back, when you lose your job, you can find strength in the most weakest moments. Last, last sentence is here. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is interesting right here where it says rest upon me. It means that. The, the, the word picture here is that of a tent. Literally, rest upon me means tabernacle on, like a tent like a tent being laid out, almost as if he's saying, God is going to cover you with this grace. Where there's a little bit of grace, there's going to be more grace for you to finish the race. And God can do that. God will do that if you trust in him. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, he says, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So I want to finish with that. You know, God, God is sufficient for us in our struggles, in our discouragements, in our marriages. Work hard in these things, but trust that God is there with you, working through you and in you, and He's going to get the glory for it. He's going to get the victory in your marriage and your life. I want to give you this time... I want to hand this time over to Steve as he leads us in communion, but I want to encourage you again with these last words. Um, Christ is sufficient. We always come short. We, we are always going to come short, but, but he's, he's faithful to come through for us. I was telling my wife last night because um, I, I really wanted to cover chapter 2, so I was going to cover this, these last verses in chapter 2, and I spent a lot of time on, on a few of these verses when, when I looked at the timer because I timed myself. Uh, oh, man, I only got one hour. That's not enough to you know fully you know, dissect chapter two. So I was really struggling in the last minute. And, I, and my worst fear is giving you a 30 minute message. Um, so maybe some, I, probably some of you want that, but um, <laughs> you can go across the street if you want that. Um, but anyway, um, God, God came through for me. And I think he does that every time because I'm always worried. Well, I'm not, I'm not ready. I'm not prepared enough. And, and he always comes through and that's his grace seen practically. And you know that for yourself as well. If you've seen him in everything that you do, God is going to come through. So I'll, so I'll finish with that. Father, thank you, Lord, for, for, for coming through for us. Thank you for dying on, on the cross for our sins and, and, and rising again in victory and glory. And Lord, help us to tap into this to, to understand that. That uh, we are more than conquerors because you, you, you are for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Fat people are fit people. I think that might be my favorite point so far. Might only be able to be topped with something about bald people. But. <laughs> so looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. 
Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night when which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So here at Calvary Chapel Yuma, we do communion once a month, the first Sunday of every month. And why? Because Jesus tells us to, right? To remind us of what, what he's done for us. Um, so looking back, it reminds us of what Jesus, Jesus did on the cross, right? But it also reminds us of his love for us. Because um, he did what he did because of his love for us. John 3.16 says, you know, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Looking forward, it reminds us that Jesus is coming back again. Because we're to do this until he returns. Um, so that gives us hope and encouragement to press on, right? We should always be living our lives um, like he could return at any day, any moment. But he also tells us to examine ourselves or to prepare our hearts, right, to receive communion. He warns us about partaking in an unworthy manner. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what an uh, unworthy manner is, um, but it, we do know that the Bible tells us that none of us are worthy, right? Right. Um, None of us deserved what Jesus did on the cross for us. Um, Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it's a gift that none of us deserve. So it's not about trying to, you know, we take a few minutes and examine ourselves and we try to do something in, uh, to make ourselves worthy real quick, right? Um, but it's about making sure our hearts are right with God before we partake in communion. So, unworthy for believers, right? It, having the wrong heart. Um, could be unforgiveness, unconfessed sin, uh, issues in your marriage or with family members or neighbors or co-workers or, or whatever, right? Most of us know what sins we haven't dealt with or what resentments we are holding on to and haven't been willing to forgive. So it's more a matter of being obedient and deciding you know what, today's the day I'm going to deal with that. Um, today's the day I'm going to do the right thing and do what God's been telling me to do um, and quit putting it off. Communion can also become just a ritual in our lives. It's something we do once a month and it doesn't really carry much weight or importance to us. Um, some of us might confess to be a believer, but no, we haven't been living like it. Only you know the things in your life that would cause you to have the wrong heart and therefore cause you to take communion in an unworthy manner. Now for an unbeliever, um, an unworthy manner would be that you haven't trusted in Jesus yet. You haven't accepted him as your savior. A savior wouldn't do much good to do uh, something in memory of what he did on the cross if you don't believe in the cross or haven't trusted in him. So, but you can take care of that as well by accepting him as your personal savior, right here where you sit, it's just a matter of believing that he died on the cross for you, that um, he rose again three days later, and now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, um, and surrendering your life to him and making him Lord of your life right now. Um, so whatever it is that might cause any of us to partake in an unworthy manner can be taken care of right now as we examine ourselves and dealing with it right now and getting our hearts right right now. So let's take a few minutes and do that.
So in Matthew 26, 26 through 28, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So let's do that. Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Dear Lord, we love you, Lord, and thank you that you love us, Lord, and you love us so much, Lord, that you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins, Lord, something that we did not deserve, Lord. Help us always to remember that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.